Oh, yes. Let's resume our class. Um, so before the break, we were talking about uh, how Jesus urges us to abide in him uh, in the same way the branches abide in the vine. And only as long as the branches stay attached to the vine, they are able to bear fruit. Uh, and in fact, uh, Jesus says, I think it was in uh, verse... Five, he says, without me, you can do nothing. So, you know, in case we are thinking that we can live uh, godly lives or be able to achieve something for the kingdom, um, or in fact, you know, gather any kind of merit, no, it can simply not be done without him. It's only through his enabling, it's only through his grace that we are able to do anything for the Lord. And uh, that becomes possible as long as we are abiding in him and, you know, allowing his word to, um, to become alive in us, in, the, in our choices, in our lifestyle. Then out of that fruit comes. Uh, so Jesus talks about us abiding in him. And he again links it to this uh, concept of loving one another. Uh, so in uh, verses 9 to 11, he again brings up this um, commandment about our having to love one another. You will notice that from this chapter 15 onwards, there's a lot of repetition where again and again, Jesus says that you must love one another. He, he stresses this more than anything else. Um, why? Because God is love. I mean, uh, that is, you know, um, one of the vital uh, aspects of who he is. And so if we wish to call ourselves his disciples, then we need to, uh, we, we too need to be moving in love just like him. Uh, and um, we really cannot even have any relationship with him if we do not have love in our hearts uh, and if we are not operating in love. So uh, it it's like very vital. And maybe that's the reason why Jesus felt the need uh, to repeat this again and again to his disciples in this last days why, you know, of his time on earth, uh, because this is one teaching that he wanted imprinted on their hearts. And so later when John writes those three epistles of his, you know, 1st John, 2nd um, uh, John and 3rd John, 1st John is again all about loving one another. I mean, uh, so that, that theme gets emphasized so much. Here, Jesus makes a very uh, interesting point in uh, verses 9 to um, 11. And um, maybe we can actually read out verses 12 to um, 15. Because in verses 9 to uh, uh, 11, he again urges the disciples and says, you know, remain in, love, in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Uh, so he talks about how if we abide in him, we will stay in his love. And immediately after that, he, uh, he again you know, reiterates the point and says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Uh, if we can have someone read out for us uh, from chapter 15, verses 12 to 17. 12 to 17. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not yeah. choose me. Oh, no, no. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to that later. Uh, so this, this, uh, so Jesus first says, you know, keep my commandments. By doing that, you will remain in my love. You will be able to enjoy the benefits of, you know, being loved by me. So stay in me. Keep my commandments. And while you're doing that, the main command which I'm giving you, you know, when I say, he said in verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And what are the commands that I want you to keep? He again says the same thing here. Verse 12, my command is this, 
love each other as I have loved you. And so he says, the greatest love would be where you are willing to lay down uh, your life for uh, others. Okay, so um, that is the kind of love that he is expecting us to uh, show towards one another. And then he makes this statement. He says, uh, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Uh, Jesus treats the disciples and his followers as friends, uh, not just people that he's just imparting some teaching to, but rather as like-minded people. You know, he believes that they will be interested in the things that he is interested in, and they will catch what he's trying to say, and they will follow the same values and principles that, you know, he is um, demonstrating in his own uh, life. So he says to them, you know, if you were servants, I would talk to you very differently. I would give you a series of orders. I would expect you to obey them, and that would be that. But I have been, everything that the Father has taught me, I've been sharing that with you. Um, why? Because I regard you as friends. I believe that you care about the same things that I care about, you know, is what Jesus is conveying over here. And so he says, this reason, the reason I'm asked, giving you this command to love one another um, is because you are not servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Why does a servant work? Why does a servant obey the orders being given by the master? Because he's going to get paid for it. He doesn't really care why the master is asking him to do that. The master says, you know, I want you to take all of these logs and you know put them over there in the in the in the in the in that storehouse. He doesn't care why the master is asking him to carry those logs and put them over there. He'll just do his job. He's not interested in finding out why and what. It doesn't interest him. He just wants his pay. But when you're asking a friend to do that, your friend understands your heart. Oh, OK, fine. Those logs are going to be used for this particular purpose. That's why he's asking my help. He wants me to you know, assist him in taking them over there. So you, you care about what is being told. You, you reflect on why it is being told. And you work towards it. So Jesus is basically saying over here, you know, if you're going to be abiding in me and I abide in you and we are going to be having this relationship, it's going to work only if you're going to be operating in love. You can't be full of hatred and unforgiveness and grudges and all of that and say, I'm abiding in the Lord. It just doesn't work that way. In the same way that the Lord operates in love, I too would need to have the same attitude and operate in love because only then would I truly be abiding in him. And I would be doing this not as a servant, just obeying an order. I would be doing this because I truly understand his heart. I understand what he is all about. You know, it says over here so clearly, a servant does not know his master's business. He doesn't care what his master's business is. He's just doing the job given to him. He wants to get paid, and that's the end of it. But if we are friends, we understand why the Lord is doing all the things that he is and why he has given us the mission that you know, he has given to each one of us. He wants us to accomplish certain things in our life. He has a purpose for us. And so we are actively involved in his business because we care about the things that he cares about. And we are partnering with him in all of this. And for us to be able to do that, we need to have the same heart that he does. So only if we are operating in love the way he does, then we can truly say that we are abiding in him. And this is a very difficult teaching. I mean, I find it very, very difficult because I, whenever I read these passages, I think, oh, am I really walking in love to the extent that Christ did? Am I really fulfilling this commandment? Because you know it is uh, it be it is so easy on so many occasions for us to become a little uh, self-centered, to focus more on our own interests than on the interests of others. So this is something that we have to constantly keep reminding ourselves of, and we need to constantly express our dependence and cry out and say, "Lord, this is going to take place only through the enabling of the Holy Spirit." So, oh Lord, you help me. 
you renew me oh lord on the inside so that i can i know give up my selfish attitudes my worldly priorities and walk in love so this is something that we constantly have to uh, learn to do uh, so it, it is possible for us to abide in the wine and have this kind of a heart of love only through the enabling of the lord and this is something that the lord wants us to consciously pursue so we talked about abiding in the wine we talked about how abiding in the wine means that you submit to him that you obey him because you know you're cleansed by his word he, he imparts his word to us on a daily basis we choose to uh, trust it obey it submit to it and by doing that we get pruned we get cleansed and um, so uh, even as we are doing that uh, we also choose to uh, live in love towards one another so that we have the right attitude now the, all that is one aspect of being uh, in the wine when you are abiding in the wine something else also happens you will encounter persecution so jesus goes on to talk about that aspect now uh, so uh, he says to them you did not choose me but i chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name he may give you so um, the fruit that you're going to be bearing it will not just be some temporary fruit with just temporary results the fruit that you bear will be eternal in the sense uh, whatever you have done for the kingdom whatever you have done for the lord will last um, it will have lasting value it will bring about change and transformation in people's lives so that is the kind of fruit that you will be able to bear and even as you're going out going forth and bearing fruit for the father even as you're going about the master's business or rather in this case the father's business because you don't you're not just regarding him as a master you're you know have a personal relationship with him and you're interested in what he is interested in so even as you are pursuing his interests and bearing fruit there are going to be many many things many challenges that you will face so all you need to do is go to the father and say lord help me i am trying to live for you i'm trying to accomplish things for you there are people that i'm trying to share the gospel with but lord there are all these challenges you help me oh lord you make a way the lord says whatever you ask the father in my name he will grant it to you so that you will be able to bear more and more fruit so over here actually it's not really a promise that is being made you know where you just keep asking things for yourself for your own self interest it's all um, at least over here and you know where where, it, where where this verse is being mentioned it's being mentioned in the context of fruit bearing so we all have this desire inside us to do something for the lord to 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 bear fruit which remains you know which has got eternal value not just some temporary thing which will really not accomplish anything much but something that is of lasting value and to be able to accomplish something like that uh, you know um, uh, it takes a lot of um, effort challenges come in our way satan tries to stop us from accomplishing those things he does not want us to bear fruit so i mean we are going through those times of difficulty we have come complete permission from jesus to go to the father in the name of jesus and say lord i am trying to bear fruit for you for your kingdom help me oh lord these are the challenges that i'm facing and these are the ways in which satan is attacking me and my family he wants me to get distracted and feel you know low and burdened so that i you know i will no longer focus and run the race lord all these things are taking place please lord i want to bear fruit you know um it talks about people who will uh, reap a hundredfold so we want to be like that right uh, so uh, that is what i want oh lord so you enable me you help me you make the way you strengthen me you give me the right scriptures to stand on you know we have we have we have the freedom to cry out to him regarding these things uh, and he will help us so even as we start doing this even as we start bearing much fruit opposition will come i mean there'll be a persecution which will come 
the world instead of being grateful for the blessing that we are being to it you know the world will instead you know um uh, spew hatred against us and uh, so jesus says when you are abiding in the vine when you start bearing much fruit and fruit which lasts eternal fruit which has got you know um, eter eternal value and repercussions when the world starts seeing you operate like that and they can see you be being so christ like they're not going to praise you they're going to hate you you know which is not, not the kind of response which we would expect you know we would think that people would applaud us and say wow you know what you're doing is good what you're doing is noble but no the world which is driven by the prince of the air will instead hate us and that is why jesus says they're going to respond in this way because you don't belong to the world he says that in verse 19 he says uh, you do not belong to the world but i have chosen you out of the world that is why the world hates you you know he said that in verse 16 he said i chose you i came to you i picked you up you know the same way he picked up uh, uh Saul on the road to Damascus and appointed him in the same way we all have been picked up and been appointed to be really fruit bearing to 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 reap a hundred fold that is the way uh, that's what he has appointed us for and when we start doing that uh the world is not going to like us it's going to uh, persecute us and so Jesus says when that happens you know do not be discouraged he says in verse 20 a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will persecute you also uh, so uh, he says do not be shocked when these things happen to you it is actually an outcome a natural result of abiding in me you will draw at least some persecution and you know uh, some kind of opposition uh, so then jesus goes on to say uh they will treat you this way because of my name that would be verse 21 uh chapter 15 verse 21 for they do not know the one who sent me um and then jesus in fact quotes uh, an old testament scripture um maybe we can read out verses 23 and 24 if someone could read out for us please verses 23 and 24 he who hates me hates my father also if i had not done among them the works which no one else did they would have no sin but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father uh, but 20. this mm. but this happened that the word might be fulfilled which was which is written in their law they hated me without a cause mm. all right so jesus is saying this is actually something that was already prophesied in the old testament that people who see miracles people who see lives being restored people who see dead the dead coming back to life and being restored to their families instead of rejoicing instead of being happy instead of being glad what is going to be their response they will hate me without reason no that's what it was already prophesied in the old testament and um uh, this phrase actually they hated me without reason is actually mentioned in two places in the old testament psalm 35 19 and also psalm 69 4 most probably jesus is not referring to psalm 69 because over there it talks about the psalmist's guilt and all of that Jesus of course had nothing to be guilty about um so most probably Jesus was quoting Psalm 35 19 where it talks about how the enemies are uh, attacking him without any reason and it says in uh, Psalm 35 verse 20 uh, they devise false accusa accusations you know so even though uh, uh, this psalmist has no has not done anything evil they are devising false accusations against him uh, and so what he is experiencing what the psalmist is experiencing is pointing towards what jesus also will experience in the future so it's a kind of messianic psalm uh, which is pointing towards something that even jesus will undergo uh, so here jesus says this law has been fulfilled what was said um, 
what was uh, what was prophesied in the law it has been fulfilled they are hating me without reason so in the same way that will be done even to you even though what you are doing is good even though what you are doing is benefiting people without reason they will hate you why because they do not know the one who sent me whom do they know they know the prince of the air because they are under the under the slavery of the prince of the air so they are blinded so they follow the instincts you know which um, the evil one is planting inside them and so even when they see good rather than appreciating the good which they are seeing there is a chance that they will persecute you so having talked about these things you know jesus moves into the last portion of chapter 15 where he says you know in the middle of all of this don't worry the helper is going to be there he is going to come to you he will testify of me and even as he is testifying of me to you you will go out and testify to other people about you know about me so in the first place he speaks to us in our heart the holy spirit speaks to us in our heart and testifies about jesus he gives us the ability to continue to trust in jesus through trials through hardships through persecution constantly the holy spirit is reminding us of the truth of who jesus is so that we can stay strong in him and even as he testifies to us we go out and we testify to other people about who this jesus is so um so um having said that jesus moves into chapter 16 and the conversation is still continuing and he says all this i have told you so that you will not fall away because when the persecution hits you will wonder has the lord abandoned me you know um have i been left all alone by myself and so jesus is saying uh, you know the reason i'm telling you all this is because you people you disciples are going to actually obey what i have told you you will abide in me and you will bear much fruit and when that happens instead of applause you're going to get persecution and so at that time you should not be shocked because bad things are going to happen to you and he goes on to explain in verse 2 he says anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to god you know i mean in fact they will uh, which is what happened in the case of uh, you know stephen i mean they were stephen um uh, speaking about jesus uh, he was uh, having this debates with all these scholars and he was proving to them from the old testament that jesus is truly the messiah and rather than being grateful that someone is explaining explaining the scriptures to them so beautifully they choose to stone him instead and in fact they all feel very very noble and godly in doing it including Saul because you know Saul is over there completely approving of what's going on and he thinks that he is doing god a service by participating and supporting the people uh, who are stoning Stephen so Jesus says these are the kind of things that are going to happen to you and when these things happen do not fall away because the holy spirit is going to be there he is going to help you uh to you know to to bear these things and uh, uh you will be able to continue abiding you will be able to hold on um so the holy spirit has not been given to us um just for pleasant times just for times when everything is going well and our spiritual walk is uh, flourishing and we feel we are feeling very good about ourselves when you're down when you feel that you that you're you know, just literally clinging on to your faith and you are and you have so many negative thoughts going through your head and you're wondering my is the lord there is it worth it is is, is it worth it pursuing uh, this christian walk should i continue working for the lord and so when you're down and you're um, you know feeling like giving up at that time the holy spirit is not displeased with you and he doesn't you know turn his turn his face away and say oh look at this person having all these negative thoughts no the holy spirit has been given to us four times like that he will testify with inside your inner man and say no this is the truth hold on to it there is hope if you hold on now tomorrow you will rejoice today you will be you will be reaping in tears but tomorrow when the harvest comes in there'll be great rejoicing and you will be glorified so the holy spirit constantly testifies to us on the inside he strengthens us so when you're feeling down and out 
and you're feeling very discouraged and you look at other believers who are like you know, on fire and going strong and you think look at me i'm so weak i'm so much down and i don't seem to have the enthusiasm and passion that i did earlier when you're feeling that way remember the holy spirit has been placed inside you for times like that as well he is there um i i like the wording that is there you know in the apc notes uh, for this particular uh, portion it um it says over there uh, the holy spirit he comes to assist people caught up in the thick of battle and who are being tried beyond their strength so if you are going through you know situations where you are being tried beyond your strength and your ability and you feel weak and you feel like giving up and you have these negative thoughts going through your head the holy spirit is not displeased with you and he's not going to move away he's in fact there for you for such situations and if you just reach out to him he will give you you know he will remind you of the scriptures he will remind you of all that jesus taught he will strengthen you he will impart to you his enabling grace so you will be able to go on and um so these things are you know uh, being told to the disciples because they're going to go through a lot of hardships when they start abiding in the wine and bearing fruit um now this would have made a lot of sense to the uh, first time readers of this gospel because those were believers who were going through a lot of persecution their neighbors their family members uh you know people whom they had uh, who had respected them in society now those people are spitting on them they're saying what you you you've given up your jewish faith you're going after this jesus i mean now uh, have you lost your mind don't you at least care about the honor of your family why are you living like this why are you doing these things you see they're going through a lot of hardship they're being thrown out of the synagogue you know in those days if you're thrown out of the synagogue it's like um, not just that you're uh, you know being barred from worship you are basically losing your social status because nobody's going to be want, uh, wanting to even associate with you um and if you are going to be looking for any job nobody's going to offer your offer a job to you because uh, you know now you're like an outcast so these believers were going through tough times and this gospel was written for them to assure them that they have taken the right step and so you know um these words which jesus speaks and says they will think that they are doing god a service when they kill you that would have made sense to them because they are uh, you know uh, undergoing a lot of persecution and in the midst of all of that they are being told listen to the holy spirit inside you even as he testifies about me these people are going to say oh you have lost the faith oh you have you know you have turned your back on the old testament scriptures that's what the uh, the the synagogue leaders are going to say but listen to the testimony of the holy spirit inside you he is testifying the truth about jesus and so hold on do not give in so for them the disciple the the fall the first time followers the believers of that time in the early church they were being opposed by all the religious leaders whom they had respected and looked up to you know they when they would go on a saturday and sit over there in the synagogue and a leader would come and stand in, uh, in front of them with a scroll and explain those scriptures to them these are their leaders these are the people who were mentoring them and now those leaders are saying what have you done with yourself i mean why are you following this jesus you you turned your back on the entire old testament is what they are saying so these people are being told by jesus to listen to the holy spirit who is going to be inside them talking to them teaching them advising them guiding them they're going to be needing this inner witness of the holy spirit to hold on to their faith even as they go through this uh, through these hardships okay so uh, so which is why jesus uh, you know takes the effort to uh, speak to them about these things and then uh, jesus says uh, in uh, chapter 16 um, maybe you if uh, if someone could read out verses 5 6 and 7 uh, john chapter 16 verses 5 6 and 7 
But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Okay, so um, uh, they are so um, heartbroken about how Jesus is going to be leaving them soon. Uh, they are not asking for details. They're not asking, where are you going? And so Jesus says in verse 6, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I'm telling you, he says, you know, it is for your good that I'm going away because then the helper will be able to come to you. Jesus can only be there with them physically um, on the outside, but the advocate will be inside them, you know, 24 7. If Jesus were to go to the next village, then, you know, they would no longer have Jesus' help uh, because physically there's only so much that he can do. But if he goes away and he sends the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be inside them 24 7, always there to help them, always there to encourage them, uh, to help them to you know, walk in Christ and bear fruit and be able to accomplish great things. So it's in fact to their advantage that he goes away. And so he says, you know, you people are now going to be bearing fruit. You're going to go out and um, talk about me. You're going to start bringing people uh, into the kingdom. So the Holy Spirit is going to help you in doing this ministry work. So he explains to them in what way the Holy Spirit will assist these uh, disciples when they go out and start doing their ministry. Now that is explained in verses 8 to 10. Uh, so if we can have someone read out for us verses 8 to 10. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Okay, we are very, very familiar with this uh, you know, passage. We talk about how the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness and judgment. But we generally do not understand what those phrases mean. So, uh, you know, here um, Jesus actually explains it. He says, first, the Holy Spirit, you know, even as you share the gospel, even as you talk about uh, me, uh, Jesus says, um, the Holy Spirit will convict these people of sin. That word convict that is used over there, I know NIV tries to use another way of phrasing. It says, um, uh, the Holy Spirit will prove to the world. Okay, so he's going to give evidence. He will, he will give proof. He will show them certain things about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. What exactly will the Holy Spirit show them? That if they reject Jesus, it is sin. Apart from him, they can have no eternal life. There can be no salvation. So the Holy Spirit convicts them on the inside and shows them that if they continue as they are, there is only death, eternal death awaiting them. So they need to accept Jesus. So as long as they continue rejecting him, it is sin. And they are in sin and they have no future, no hope. The Holy Spirit also convicts of, uh, okay, the word convict over here is, is basically, you know, the word, the uh, Greek word, elexo or something like that. Um, so anyway, that word basically is saying, proof he gives proof so the, the next thing that he proves the holy spirit proves to the people is that in jesus christ there is righteousness so jesus christ has gone to the father the the sacrifice that he uh, presented before the father of himself you know as the lamb it was acceptable to god so now he's standing over there in god's presence as our intercessor so in him his righteousness has been imparted to us. So if we reject him, there is only sin and death. On the other hand, if we accept him, because he is now our advocate in front of the Father, 
there will be righteousness. So that is why, you know, that's the, the first part is talking about people who do not believe in me, who reject him, that is sin. Then verse 10 talks about the righteousness part of it, where it says, because I'm going to the Father. So when he goes to the Father, there he will be uh, ever present as our intercessor and his righteousness is imparted to us. The third thing or the proof that the Holy Spirit will give people um, uh, regarding these spiritual things, it's about judgment. So what is the thing that Jesus says about judgment? Because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Okay, so Jesus Christ has finished passing judgment upon uh, the, this prince of the world. Um, he thought he was defeating Jesus Christ on the cross, but he was unable to do that. Jesus Christ rose from the dead victorious. And uh, so now the prince of this world stands defeated and condemned. Anyone who chooses to continue following this prince of this world will have to share in that judgment and condemnation with Satan. So the Holy Spirit, even as we try to minister to people in our own way, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we talk to them, we share truths with them. Um, you know, we, we show them acts of love so that they will experience what Jesus Christ is like. You know, they will experience his love through us. Even as we do all of these things, the Holy Spirit starts working in those people's lives to give them spiritual proof deep in their, you know, being where he, they will start developing an awareness of how dangerous it is to reject Christ. He will, the, he, the Holy Spirit will start revealing to them the righteousness that they can have as a result of which they'll be able to enter heaven one day. You know, so he starts uh, imparting that to them. Uh, so the Holy Spirit starts opening their spiritual eyes so that they can see these truths and so that they can escape from the coming judgment and they won't have to share that judgment with the prince of this world. Uh, so these are the these are the things which the Holy Spirit will do through us when we go and minister to people. So we don't go in our own strength. We just pray and we say, Lord, I'm preparing the best I know how. And so sincerely, I'm going to try and do this. But Lord, you're going to, you're going to come along with me because you are in me. The Holy Spirit is in us and he will guide us. He will show us what to say when the time comes. So um, the Lord enables us to minister. Um, all right. Um, maybe we can. Uh, maybe we can look at uh, John chapter sixteen, verses nineteen to twenty-two. Uh, if you look at the earlier portion, uh, you know, uh, John sixteen, verses sixteen to eighteen, we've kind of dwelt on that already. Uh, you know, because uh, they ask him in a little while, you're going away. So uh, so he says that he's going away in a little while. So they want to know exactly what he means by in a little while. Uh, so we've already kind of dwelt upon that. Um, let's look at this portion. Uh, uh, verses 19 to 22 of chapter 16. Yeah. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Yeah. So here um, Jesus says that um, when I go away, you know, he's basically talking about his crucifixion in verse 20. He says, very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. So when the crucifixion takes place, they will be in deep mourning. But uh, the people of the world who have done the, the crucifying, you know, they will rejoice. So all of that will happen. But uh, in verse 21, Jesus says, it will be like a woman giving birth. She goes through the pain of giving birth, 
but once the child is born the joy is so great that she doesn't even dwell on the pain that she went through because now the child has come forth and you know um, now there is some uh, this new chapter beginning in her life and so in the same way jesus says uh, what's going to happen in the near future is going to be very painful uh, uh, so in verse 22 he says now is your time of grief but i will see you again and you will rejoice so in that context he speaks in verse 23 he says in that day you will no longer ask me anything very truly i tell you my father will give you whatever you ask in my name jesus is basically saying there are very wonderful great things coming of course there's going to be this time of deep grief you know where it will be very painful for you while the world is rejoicing you will be completely broken but i will see you again you know because after the resurrection jesus comes back to visit them and he explains many many more things to them at that time so he says um once this uh, this new chapter comes through in that day you don't have to come to me and ask for things you know the last three years that's basically what the disciples were doing i mean they they would go to him for every little thing you know they would they were completely dependent on him and uh, so they're probably thinking in their heads my goodness if jesus goes away whom are we going to turn to who's going to help us so jesus tells them you will not even need to ask me anything you know what you'll straight away go to the father directly and you'll ask him in my name and whatever you require he'll give you the direct access to him now you know you're coming to me and you're asking me and you you seek my help and all that at that time you can just go directly to him so these are really amazing words of promise that jesus is giving them and he says until now you have not asked for anything in my name you you would come to me physically and ask for something but you never went to the father in my name and asked for big big things but you know you do it ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete and then he goes on to say uh, in verse 26 sorry verse 26 he says in that day you will ask in my name i am not saying that you will ask the father um on your behalf uh, i'm not saying that i will ask the father on your behalf so the point that he is making over here is that it's not like i have to go to an angry god and somehow you know uh, persuade him to do something good for you okay so he says um i am not saying that i will ask the father on your behalf you will not need my intercession you can directly go to him because it's here uh, the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that i came from god so if you have placed your faith in me if you believe that i am the son of god and that you have salvation and eternal life in me if you believe in me then the father loves you and he is no longer an angry god that you are approaching fearfully you can just directly go into his presence and directly ask him in my name and whatever is required he will grant it to you and it says your joy will be complete so uh, this would have been a very great revelation for them because up to now their entire dependence was on the physical jesus the one you know who's been walking with them and uh, sharing with them but now when jesus is going to be removed from the picture they don't have to be distressed because they are going to have direct access to the father and he's not going to be an angry god where some intercessor has to come in between and say please could you do something for these people no he says that is why he says i'm not saying that i will ask i'm not going to do any inter interceding you can directly go to the father yourself now in case you're thinking of romans chapter 8 where it talks about jesus who is um, you know romans 8:34 where it says that jesus is standing in god's presence as intercessor or there it's talking about a different kind of intercession it's talking about how as long as he's standing over there in god's presence it is a reminder to the father that he has finished paying the sacrifice and so now righteousness has been imparted to us and so a right relationship has been established and therefore nothing can separate us from the love of god why because constantly jesus is standing over there as proof 
that the sacrifice has been uh, made and uh, so nothing can separate us from the love of god is you know what that romans 8 talks about uh, so intercession in that sense where uh, he is standing over there uh, having finished the work of atoning and so the right relationship between the father and us has been established here he is saying i don't need to intercede for you with regard to prayer requests you know because um, sometimes when prayers are not being answered we say oh if only jesus was here then i think my answer, my prayer would be answered ah that's a very wrong theology so even though jesus is not physically present over here in his name just in his name if you approach the father the father will hear you he has heard you he will answer in his time he knows better than you his brain is bigger you know he, he knows he has greater wisdom so he will do it so just because there's some silence over there don't make assumptions because that jesus has made very very clear over here he says i don't need to be physically present over here to be helping you because i'm not going to be here physically present i am going to be physically present in front of the throne romans 8 34 and as long as i'm standing over there Every time the father looks at me, it's clearly understood. The transaction has been completed. The right relationship between God, the father, and us has been completely, totally restored. So yes, when we go to him and ask, uh, what will be the result? Our joy will be complete. So we can have this deep assurance that our prayers will be answered in his time. That is one condition, okay, that we need to accept. Jesus does not follow our timetable. He does it according to his divine timetable. He knows what is best for us. And so uh, sometimes it helps for us to wait uh, upon his timetable and allow him allow uh, him to do things his way. So having said all of these things, finally, at the end of chapter 16, in verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So all these things that Jesus said to his disciples, it was basically to bring them peace so that they no longer have to feel troubled, uh, so that they no longer have to be anxious that Jesus is leaving in me you will have peace is what Jesus assures. So even though Jesus is not physically present over here among us, we have the Holy Spirit within us who testifies of Jesus. And so in that sense, you know, the father and son have come and made their home in us. Um, that um, we will, we, oh, I think that's already, we didn't touch upon that in John chapter 14. Yeah, so you know it says the Father and I will come and make our home uh, with you. Uh, so, so we already have the Lord with us in us. So even though there's going to be much trouble in the world, um, we can have peace because the Lord who is inside us has finished overcoming the world. He already has a solution for every problem you are ever you are ever going to have. Okay, so you on your own may not know how to overcome those things. But the one who is in you, the one who is greater than he who is in the world, he has already out-schemed Satan. Whatever schemes Satan may have been trying to you know, uh, bring upon you, he has already been out-schemed, out-strategized. The one who is in you already knows how to take care of this. Now, all you need to do is just trust in him and you know wait upon him by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you can have peace knowing fully that the Lord will cause everything to work out in his perfect timing. Okay, so that's the assurance that we have in the Lord. Um, so um, let's just close with a word of prayer. Yeah. Lord, we just thank you so much for the very encouraging teachings, O Lord, that you imparted to us in these three chapters. Oh Lord, we really want to abide in the wine so that we can enjoy all of these things that you have promised us. So we pray, O oh Lord, that even as we spend time in your presence every day, even as we have our devotions, even as we read your word and cleanse our hearts and minds with it, uh, even as we go through all of these processes and procedures, 
oh lord i pray that you would make it all um meaningful and real for us through your holy spirit so that oh lord um we are able to bear much fruit in every area of our lives oh lord and so that we uh, will be able to bring glory to your name because of the lifestyles that we are leading and we thank you for your promise that we can just come in jesus name to the father and you will grant us whatever we require you will cause our joy to be complete yes we will have trouble in the world but you have promised that in you we can have peace because you have overcome the world oh lord you have a solution for every problem that comes our way so we thank you oh lord for all of these privileges which we have in you thank you oh lord in jesus name amen Thank you. Thank you, Pastor.